Good evening, SOAS. It's a very lively event tonight. Colleagues, students, invited guests. My name is Eddie Bruce Jones, and I'm the head of the School of Law, Gender, and Media here at SOAS. And I'd like to welcome you to campus. And for those joining us via the live stream, hi, everyone in the room uh, or at home. It's nice to have you with us. This evening, we're delighted to welcome back to SOAS, UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territory Occupied Since 1967, Francesca Albanese. Special Rapporteur Albanese is an important part of SOAS, not only because she's an alumna of the master's program in human rights law, but also because of long-standing work she's done during her career as an international legal expert, and most recently during her mandate as Rapporteur. The moral fortitude and courage she's shown in defense of the rule of law and for observance of international human rights standards in the most challenging of circumstances, the rigorous analysis and clear language of her reporting, and the generosity she's shown through the visibility she has assumed in this role on behalf of so many around the world who are deeply concerned with the fate of Palestinian people, not to mention the integrity and accountability of the global community around the most serious breaches of international criminal law. Given her commitments to detailed analysis of international law, her critical engagement with the challenge of global geopolitics, and her unwavering warnings on the human and environmental costs in mapping out what she's called the anatomy of a genocide, Special Rapporteur Albanese exemplifies the very best of what we seek to instill in our law students. So I'm very pleased to see many SOAS students here today. Just a few housekeeping matters. First, the fire exits are on both sides of the room. And uh, if you go up halfway up the stairs, there are fire doors that you can leave through and you should uh, gather on Mallet Street, which is leaving the building, making a left. Secondly, there's a student photographer and there are journalists um, taking photos and videos, uh, mainly towards the stage, but just be aware of that. And there are some notices as well on the walls about this. Um, third, we are advised that uh, there are protests taking place around the building. Um, our vice chancellor was unequivocal in his support for this event to go forward. And we're committed to academic free speech as an institution. And lastly, please ensure your phones are turned off. So it just leaves me to welcome you once again to SOAS and to introduce my colleague, Dr. Michelle staggs Kelsall, co-director of the Center for Human Rights Law to open the session. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to SOAS. As Eddie mentioned, my name is Michelle staggs Kelsall, and I'm co-director here at the Center for Human Rights Law. Uh, at the School of Law, Gen Gender and Media, and I will be your chair and facilitator for this evening's events. This is, event is the first in the Centre's program under the theme Imperialism, Colonialism and Human Rights, the litmus test of Palestine. It stems from a research away day during which Centre members gathered together to frame and plan our activities for the 2024-25 academic year. Together, we agreed the focus should be, in fact, had to be, on Palestine. The particular title for the theme that emerged is based on an article by our friend and colleague, Dr. Nima Sultani, who joins us here tonight. Another friend and colleague, Professor Lynn Welshman, will address you in just a few moments. The Centre's members were keen to host a public lecture on this theme, and we're joined in both our desire and planning for this event by colleagues in the Center for the Study of Colonialism, Empire and International Law and the Center for Palestine Studies. We are, of course, absolutely delighted to be hosting Francesca Albanese, United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in the Occupied Palestinian Territory since 1967. The Special Rapporteur herself is a SOAS graduate, as Eddie mentioned, taught by international law scholar Dr. Catriona Drew and in Welshman, amongst other of many faculty here at SOAS. Like you, we look forward very much to hearing her thoughts on this theme. As Centre Directors, we stand in solidarity 
with the Palestinian people's right to self-determination, to be free from apartheid and colonialism, and to live in freedom, equality, dignity, and peace in their homeland. We remain appalled by the tacit acceptance and use of law to legitimize, in the words of Special Rapporteur Albanese herself, genocide as colonial erasure through, through the destruction of the Palestinian people, their schools, universities, hospitals, houses, and lands. In addition to the use of highly permissible interpretations of international humanitarian law and the law on the use of force to legitimize genocidal acts in Gaza. In keeping with the orders and advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice, we agree that the only resolution to the current genocidal war on Gaza is a permanent ceasefire. The rapid end to the Israeli colonial occupation and an end to racial segregation and apartheid, as well as the provision of full reparations for the Palestinian victims. We stand in solidarity with Rapporteur Albanese in the face of attempts to silence her powerful and courageous voice and remain fully supportive of her work toward this end. I now call upon my colleague, Professor Lynn Welshman, to introduce both tonight's theme and the speaker. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Gosh, wonderful to see so many people. If there's a loud bang, that would be my stick falling. So please forgive me in advance. Okay, thank you, Michelle. I assume you were nice about me before I came in. Um, I will find you. Thank you all very much. Um, it's my honor to introduce and welcome Francesca Albanese, who will be next to the door, you'll be pleased to know. I'm only having five minutes and I speak very quickly, so you'll feel like it's, it's gone in a second, I hope. Um, she was appointed uh, by the Human Rights Council in March 2022 on the basis of a 1993 resolution, you can all hear me, right, by the then Human Rights Committee. And she's had many illustrious and outspoken and extremely um, impressive and uh, long-lasting special rapporteurs before her, but she has made this mandate her own since her appointment. Francesca is an affiliate scholar at the Institute for the Study of International Migration at Georgetown. She's senior advisor on migration and formal displacement, sorry, forced displacement for the think tank Arab Renaissance for Democracy and Development. And she's widely published clearly on the legal situation in Israel, Palestine, including Palestinian refugees and international law. This event tonight is the first in our Centre of Human Rights Laws um, uh, theme this year. We've chosen the theme of imperialism, colonialism and human rights, the litmus test of Palestine. And this theme is taken from an article by our colleague Nimr Sultani. Where is Nimr? Make yourself. He is there. Yeah, he is right there. Okay. Nimr. That's not included in my five minutes, that clap by Nimmer. Um, so, uh, so the article by Nimmer in which he argues that the question of Palestine is not so much an exception to, but more a litmus test for international law and the human rights system. I went to the enormous trouble of looking up litmus test in a massive online dictionary, which is always useful. And I found it means a decisive, well, I didn't know really, but it's better when they say it, a decisively indicative test, an example of which they gave effectiveness in these cases, read Palestine, is often a good litmus test of overall quality, or perhaps we could think fitness for purpose when it comes to international law and the human rights system. These are legitimately concerns and objects of study and interest for scholars, not just sense critical legal scholars, but scholars of law and of other disciplines um, as we watch the genocide unfold in Gaza. Equally legitimate are the efforts led by Palestinian actors, including notably Palestinian legal scholars, to mobilize in the field of international law as a site among other sites of resistance and struggle. 
This year, we've seen the ICJ preliminary ruling in the South Africa case versus Israel on finding a plausible risk of genocide occurring and, provincial, and provisional measures for prevention. We've seen the ICJ enormously, stupendously important advisory opinion on the legal consequences of the occupation and the illegality of Israel's occupation. And these things add up and they have shelf life. Um, and there's, there's all sorts of ways of, of, of using them and seeking to implement. But these are important um, developments this year. All states are expected to comply with provisional measures and orders to prevent or punish the commission of genocide and to avoid assisting the continuation of the unlawful occupation, as has most recently been made clear by the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner, Volker Turk, who last week called on... Uh, world leaders to act immediately to ensure respect for the conventions, for Geneva, Convention, for Geneva Conventions and the, Commission, and the Convention on Genocide to act to prevent crimes when a risk becomes apparent. Britain has been shamelessly, um, why well, I don't quite know word, dragging its feet, I could say, several words, in responding to these uh, preliminary findings and in complying with provisional measures, including sales of arms and so on. They apply to Britain as well as to all other states. To the extent that a couple of weeks ago, in fact, the day after South Africa submitted its memorial, this enormous document of evidence on, on, on crimes of genocide in Gaza by Israeli forces and, and the government and so on, the day after they submitted this memorial to the ICJ for that case, David Lammy told the House of Commons that these terms, i.e. genocide, were largely used when millions of people lost their lives and the way in which they are used now undermines the seriousness of that term. Let us be clear, the legal threshold for genocide has nothing to do with numbers. And this from a SOAS School of Law graduate. SOAS Law students, where are you? Take note. Happily, we have with us tonight, or within a minute, another graduate of SOAS School of Law who has a substantially firmer grip on the principles of and obligations arising from international law than does the current British Foreign Secretary. Francesca has been plugging, has been playing a valiant and defiant role since her appointment in 2022, but especially in the past year. It's been valiant because knowing the likely reaction to her interventions by Israel supporters and allies, she has nevertheless been calling out Israeli crimes for what they are and helping the development of the applicable legal framework. It's defiant because Francesca has been subjected to a veritable barrage of smears, slurs, accusations of anti-Semitism, uh, calls for her to be removed from her mandate. As to, you may have seen the ban Fran outside. That's about banning Francesca from the UN. She has answered all these with vigour and moral clarity that not only respond to the charges that have been made against her, but they further um, the examination of those slurs for what they are and what they're trying to do and where they fit in the lawfare that Israel wages against those who insist that the law does not in fact support and indeed provides no defence for Israel's atrocity crimes in Gaza now and the wider occupied Palestinian territories for decades. So, I give you Francesca. Thank you. Please, without further ado. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, good evening, everyone, distinguished colleagues and friends. I'm deeply honored and grateful to the University of SOAS, the School of Law, Gender and Media for organizing and inviting me to this event, to Professor Eddie Bruce-Jones for having us here, 
uh, to Professor Lynn Weltman. I have to say that I, I should thank you for the introduction, but I couldn't hear a word so from behind the door. door. But I'm sure it was good. <laughs> but all the more, I want to thank you for all what you have done uh, in the field of human rights inside and outside the academia. Uh, to Michelle Stag Skelso and uh, Dr. Vidya Kumar for organizing and moderating these events today. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Nimesh Sultani for being part of it and for being a critical voice for justice. Nimesh, I don't know where you are, but all right. thank you for being a critical voice for justice in Palestine, all the more in these uh, times of confusion and darkness. It is always um, heartwarming to me, for me to come back to SOAS. It is not secret that my time at SOAS just a few years ago, has been profoundly influential in shaping both my academic and professional journeys. And I'm finally happy to see that this year, this has further blossomed into, into a new form of engagement from coming here and speak to you guys into a concrete and productive partnership with the Human Rights Clinic, which is supporting my current research for my next report to the Human Rights Council. And I want to acknowledge and thank four fabulous students, Khaled, Fosia, Candela and Francesca. Thank you, guys. Before and besides this, this institution has provided me with a foundational knowledge to comprehend the original sin of international law and its use as a tool of colonization and imperialism. When it comes to Palestine, this grounding has been instrumental in understanding the fundamental questions posed by the current reality in Palestine and how it can and must be defended through legal frameworks and avenues. Now, nearly 20 years later, not just a few years, but however, in my pers this perspective proves central to my work as a UN Special Rapporteur, most especially, most especially now, now having found myself deeply engaged with one of the most abhorrent crises and crimes of this century. The situation in Palestine today is harrowing, and I will expand upon it upon this. But it is necessary to state clearly and upfront that the injustice that the Palestinian people have been forced to tolerate, to suffer and adapt to for nearly a century, and which has spir spiraled seemingly uncontrollably into genocide, is the consequence of neglecting to address the persistent colonial and imperial legacy that lays at the core, at the heart of, the interna of international law and the current multilateral system and the accompanying colonial amnesia. Hence, I am all invigorated by the title of this lecture, Imperialism, Colonialism, and Human Rights, the Litmus Test of Palestine. To frame this discussion, we must first understand imperialism. This quite vituperated word that likely induced most to think of the US into something that is actually far more depraved and dangerous than mere contemporary US politics and foreign policy. And yes, I know that it's hard to fathom. Palestinian scholar and admittedly an intellectual giant of our time, Edward Said, described imperialism as the process of, quote, thinking about settling on controlling land that you do not possess, that is distant, that is lived on and owned by others, end of quote. This con cognitive and material process, he explained, is integral to the establishment of empires. But what Said is describing is also colonization, isn't it? And indeed, the ent entwinement of colonialism and imperialism cannot be overlooked in our understanding of how international law is operationalized and deployed in pursuit of justice, or otherwise. While there has been some acknowledgement of the role of colonialism, of the role that colonialism has played and the use of law as an instrument of subjugation and dispossession, the un underlying imperialist ideologies remain debated primarily within the confines of academia, uh, academic discourse, but de facto obscured. And as a global society, we often find it challenging to conceptualize and articulate our defense against these enduring structures. Even human rights, the tool that we have to protect ourselves and vindicate our claims of universal values vis-a-vis -vis state authorities, are often manipulated as a tool of political power, 
However, I do believe that when properly understood and applied, human rights can still pave the way forward for justice and equality. This is in fact the tool, the most peaceful tool we still have to pursue that reality. And this brings me to the situation in Palestine. In a year that I've been forced to become a chronicler of genocide, I have realized that the denialism and obscurantism which have enveloped the facts that constitute the, the current catastrophe are unprecedented in magnitude, pervasiveness, and dangerousness. Neither are coincidental, though. But allow me first to put the situation of the Palestinian people, as it is now, squarely in our minds. In Gaza, for 401 days, we have watched Israel's constant bombing, sniper and artillery fire, continuing to spare nothing and no one. Warfare has shown its most ruthless face. Large-scale indiscriminate bombing, the use of artificial intelligence selected targeted systems, the persistent surveilling, surveilling of unmanned drones overhead, automatic snipers firing people as they shop in markets, collect water, seek medical help, or even as they sleep in tents, or soldiers bunkered down in tanks attacking unarmed civilians. Burned alive, left to die, agonizingly slow deaths under the rubble. Whole generations of family crowded in homes that are bombed and erased in single instance. Hospitals and refuge, refugee camps now turned into cemeteries full of journalists, students, doctors, nurses, persons with disabilities that once inhabited these now decimated lands. Conservative figures indicate that in 13 months, the Israeli military assault on Gaza has killed, injured, or maimed, or buried under the rubble at least 155,000 Palestinians, exterminating 45,000 people, 70% of whom have steadily been women and children. Indeed, 700 babies under the age of one not even crawling by the time they were killed, are among the 17,000 children massacred. And tens of thousands have been orphaned and un an unconscionable number left limbless. Israel has destroyed Gaza. What remains is wasteland of rubble, garbage, and human remains where survivors hold on to life amid widespread deprivation and disease. The Palestinians trapped there have experienced a level of violence not seen anywhere in this century. Thousands of prisons statistically tortured and many raped. Mangled and desecrated bodies piled up and left decomposing in the street. Destruction of homes, the violation of intimate life, months of relentless forced displacement across a territory rendered unlivable, with nowhere to flee and little access to the most basic necessities clean water, basic food, shelter, proper sanitation, medical supplies, basic hygiene kits. All are painfully and largely unavailable. Families in Gaza find themselves stripped of everything familiar, robbed of their dignity, their futures, indistinctively darkened by despair. The mass graves scattered throughout Gaza tell chilling stories of those lost. Twisted limbs emerging with signs of IV drips still attached or zip tied evoke a profound sense of tragedy and abandonment. Each grave serving as a silent testament to the horrors endured by the millions of Palestinians trapped in Gaza. Countless stories now lost to the void of the unknown, leaving a community engulfed in grief and imaginable, unimaginable suffering. A destiny imposed on them by human design. And despite 13 months of this televised horror, still, as we speak, Israel intensifies its own slot, and not only in Gaza. In fact, the acute violence has long been metastasizing to the West Bank, where clear patterns are replicating from Gaza. Since October 7, last year, the rate at which Palestinians in the West Bank have been killed has increased 10 times compared with the previous 20-year average, including 169 children among the over 700 Palestinians killed there. Palestinian, Palestinian academics, 
human rights defenders, children, have been arbitrarily swept up and incarcerated in a campaign of mass arrest, now facing deprivation, torture, and squalid conditions without charge or trial. Thousands have been displaced in the largest land grab in 30 years. Confronted with this deliberate human-made catastrophe, the discussion regarding the possibility of Israel having committed acts of genocide remains astonishingly a contested one, particularly in the West. It is emblematic of an impunity that has obscured, muted, sacrificed the plight of the Palestinians on the altar of political convenience for decades. But it is one, one known of us not least the Palestinians can afford to allow fester any longer. This is why, already by March 2024, when I presented my fourth report to the United Nations, titled Anatomy of a Genocide, I concluded that there were reasonable grounds to believe that Israel had committed at least three acts of genocide in its five months of assault on Gaza, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental ha harm to members of the group, and deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And I was also not the only voice denouncing it. Because already by November 2023, 13 independent UN experts had joined me in raising the alarm of genocide on at least three occasions. By January, The International Court of Justice had, ident uh, had identified a plausible risk of irreparable harm to Palestinian rights under the Genocide Convention and recommended, indicated, provisional measures to stop, to stop it. Alongside this, hundreds of legal experts and historians, including Israeli genocide scholars, among whom the most renowned Uh, Holocaust and Gen genocide scholars, Professor Raz Sigal, Professor Amos Goldberg, and Professor Omar Bartov, I concluded that Israel was carrying out, out a genocide. And still, 13 months into this eminently avoidable tragedy, there still remains resistance to understanding this as a genocide. While there is the recognition that Israel might have committed war crimes or crimes against humanity at best, Such framings reflect no more than what Palestinians have always endured at the hand of Israel before the current escalation. Missing the genocide framework leaves the totality of Israeli destructive conduct camouflaged behind a distortion of hum uh, international humanitarian law, human shields, evacuation orders, safe zones, collateral damage, It is also obscured behind the overly technical and reductive reasoning and, frankly, ignorant speculations regarding what genocide really is. And the still developing, developing international jurisprudence on genocide is often used as an excuse not to affix the label of genocide to what is now happening in Palestine. But the failure to recognize the current events as genocide means a failure to understand the, the scale of the crime inflicted and to understand the urgent trajectory of Israeli conduct and the serious risk of erasure Palestinians are facing in the little that remains of their homeland. And it serves to justify, for all states, their failure to take responsibility for what the Genocide Convention was enacted to do, to prevent, stop, and then punish genocide. What constitutes genocide is not established according to personal history or personal opinions. It's defined in what the 1948 Convention on Genocide um, refers to as acts of killing, infliction of physical or psychological harm, creation of conditions of life leading to the destruction of, of the group, prevention of birth and forcible transfer of children. The critical element is the commission of these acts must be underpinned by an intent, a special intent to destroy the group in total or in part. Uh, the group, of course, is intended as a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. So what distinguishes genocide from the other crimes like crimes against humanity and war crimes is the special intent, so the mens rea uh, behind these acts. The targeting, in this case, of the Palestinian group to destroy them as a group. 
The key in proving the crime is therefore to identify the singular thread of intent that runs through the collective conduct, meaning all the acts and all the crimes that have been committed. But you see, I think that this denial is not accidental. As an indigenous scholar, uh, Lian Beta Samosake Simpson, from the land I have just visited, Turtle Island, known to us as Canada, uh, the project of settler colonialism eventually was a simple one. Colonizers wanted the land. And everything else that indigenous peoples are burdened with daily, the legal or policy or economic or social discrimination, the residential, school, the residential schools or the gender violence is all part of the machinery that was designated to create a perfect crime, a crime where the victims were unable to see or name the crime itself as a crime. In other words, the, these obscurities, this invisibilization is integral to sustaining the colonial and imperial system. If we cannot see it, we cannot address it. And this is why I insist on the genocide framing, because the destruction we see in Palestine is exactly and precisely what settler colonialism does. This is what the settler colonial genocide is. The destruction is, of course, physical and biological. It's a devastation of the group in order to take control of the land. And this is the critical point, the land. This is central to understanding the, the intent that drives Israel's genocide. So we must step out of our Western understanding of land and place and property. Because for the Palestinians, as for all indigenous people, the land is not the place where they live. The land is who they are. And this creates an inherent conflict between Israel who seeks to acquire the land and the Palestinian for whom the land is integral to their existence. And this is what orients the settler colonial state toward the need to eliminate the indigenous. And this is why the displacement, the dispossession, the cultural destruction, the devastation of food sovereignty, which are of course war crimes and crimes against humanity on their own accord, are also to be seen as intended to severe the cultural belonging and connection of the Palestinian to the land. These acts are corrosive to the human and psychological spirit, <laughs> as too many indigenous people can attest today. Hence, they are genocidal. And in the face of this, a minority of powerful member state, rather than halting its momentum, have staggeringly provided military, economic, political support to Israel, as it was committing atrocities. Devastating as this has been to so many in this room, <laughs> these broader actions are revealing of the scale of the struggle that the Palestinians face, but I also say that we all face. Without a doubt, the colonial amnesia of the West has condoned Israel's settler colonial project, creating for Israel an exceptional state status that has enabled the current catastrophe and what preceded it. But Palestine illuminates the inextricable link between colonization, imperialism, and capitalism. And here I return to Said's understanding of imperialism, the process of dominating another distant land. This is one of creating empire through the formation of relationship, formal or informal, in which one state controls the effective political sovereignty of another society. Within this rubric, colonialism can be understood just as one modality of imperial domination, one which is not new. What Palestine lays bare is the way in which colonial violence under, um, intersects with, our, with the other colonial, uh, sorry, with the other imperial modality, which is capitalism. And this is why we need to understand the role of fossil fuel extraction arms proliferation, surveillance and technology, and domination of people, and therefore the empire. Amidst an emerging natural, amidst, sorry, emerging natu natural catastrophes and escalating social and economic strife that is inextricably tied to a exploitation of natural resources, today our humanity finds itself at a critical juncture. And somewhat, Palestine is now providing us the opportunity to see it fully exposed and in its totality, 
what is happening. What is happening is giving us a choice to act in solidarity, collectively and conscientiously. The devastation wrought upon them demands that we recognize this juncture and take real and concrete action to diagnose and redress, redress this issue. While Palestinians, but also Israelis, need now more than ever liberation from the scorch of settler colonialism, I mentioned both because both have, are victims of settler colonialism, while, although with different agency and suffering. We must accompany them, embrace and help them, and take it as a way to liberate ourselves in the process. Because imperialism, in its various manifestations, temptations, and illusions of prosperity, is what entraps us all. It is the only way to end, for all of us, the current malaise and the demands we confront imperial power structures. We, we must act coherently, since as those at the heart of power with proximity to the US presidency have rightly observed, the empire is busy creating its own realities, while we are still judiciously and meticulously, meticulously studying the reality as it was. And here I turn my eye to the universities. I cannot, I cannot ignore that it has been the young people from within universities that have so readily understood this this year, the urgency and the interconnectedness of all struggles. Through the student-led encampment that sprang as a movement from the United States and germinated in campuses US and including here, it is the students who have spoken truth to power, who have risked and are risking their future to take a stand where too few would. In doing so, you, the students, have given the Palestinians a rare sense of being truly seen, of their struggle being heard, of the possibility amid incredible suffering that their humanity was understood and that it was shared. And this stands in stark contrast to the responses of institutions of power, including universities. Whether it be political leadership in the West and too many states in the global South or academic institutions, those that equip our young people with the knowledge to mold our collective futures. In this institution, we teach human rights and history in the classroom, but it's the, these very institutions who are suppressing the real and concrete actions, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly. The right to education of the students advocating for the human rights of the Palestinians in the face of the gravest reality. Both the students amplifying Palestinian voices and the Palestinian people themselves have to face the gauntlet of being abused, blamed and smeared as they struggle to be seen and acknowledged in their own suffering and humanity. The dehumanization st that starts at the end of Israeli authorities reverberates and amplifies in the West and everywhere else, all in service of imperial power and the sustaining of empire, preserving themselves. So I urge you to continue. I'm not just talking to the students, huh? just to be, <laughs> to become fiercer, more strategic, even more out of the box thinkers than you have been so far, while always staying peaceful in the face of adversity and provocation. Right? <laughs> we have to set the bar higher to make our demands and your demands more concrete, not just to your universities, but also to make sure that all of us are, are heard by political leaders. And for this, you and us must explore alliances outside this illustrious institution. We cannot allow in a way that is akin to <laughs> age test. We cannot allow in a way that is akin to a clockwork orange was was not watched it? <laughs> no, you have watched it. <laughs> so we cannot allow in a way that is akin to a clockwork orange that the live stream genocide and its associated apathy desensitize us to the violence, normalize the oppression, dissociate us from its moral failure and legitimize the legitimate. We cannot allow it to clockwork us into a conditioned acceptance of the unthinkable. Where the catastrophe of World War II led us to the decolonization, the advancement of the human rights movement and international codification of human rights law in the 50s and 60s, allowing us 
we the people, to gain terrain and transform law into an instrument of justice, at least showed its full potential, Palestine demonstrates how far we have to go if we are to uproot imperialism that still remains embedded at the core of our international political and legal system. The legal tools are there. We have just to understand the problem in order to know how to deploy them. And for this, we need to see the structure because once we see it, we can no longer unsee it. You may want to explore ways to hold decision makers accountable through your constitutional and administrative law lawyers, for example. British citizens who have served in the Israeli occupation forces and settlers living in the occupied Palestinian territory should be held accountable with the support of criminal lawyers. Uh, through corporate and torturous law, companies, British companies profiting from the unlawful occupation and this genocide, including banks and pension funds, should be forced to account for their due diligence and their action beyond our borders. And of course, universities must cut the relationship and investment in Israel. I will leave you I will leave you with two final thoughts as a Holocaust survivor Primo Levi who could not survive the society the Holocaust left behind warned us at the root of this colossal suffering is the quote rejection of human solidarity obtuse and cynical indifference to the suffering of others abdication of the intellect and of moral sense to the principle of authority, and above all, at the root of everything, a sweeping tide of cowardice, a colossal cowardice which masks itself as warring virtue, love of country, and faith in an idea, end of quote. This is all we have to reject. So I urge you to reunite, second thought, the butterfly effect that swept from these campuses throughout the world. Alone, we are frail like wings of butterflies. But if we start flapping our wings in unison, together we will make a storm. And may justice be our storm. Thank you.